welcome to my second video on forensic psychology. Um, this one is about biological explanations of crime, genetic and neural explanations. As always, the information comes from the Pink Haired Girl book. Um, I'm not doing a video for every section in this book, just the ones which have more information in them. This one is quite information heavy, so it's good to do a look at before you come into class so you've got some idea of what genetic and neural explanations are so that um, we can work on that knowledge and understanding in class. Okay, so first up, genetic explanation of crime. Genes consists of DNA. DNA consists of characteristics. So perhaps, for example, I would have um, DNA that gives me brown hair and blue eyes. So it produces instructions of how we look and develop. This then impacts on the characteristics that we display, such as hair colour, eye colour, intelligence, mental disorders, and some psychologists theorise criminal behaviour. A neural explanation is any explanation of behaviour and any disorders in terms of function in the brain. So um, this can link to the nervous system, such as neurotransmitters and brain structure. Um, for example, the um, theory of depression um, with the neurotransmitters and the low level of serotonin, that would be a neural explanation. So the genetic explanation of crime would be that the criminal has inherited a gene from their family members and this has led them to a predisposition to commit crimes. The first, um, one of the first criminal studies done was done on twins um, and it was conducted by Lange in 1930 who investigated monozygotic and dizygotic twins. Monozygotic twins are twins which share one egg. Now I'm not going to go into a massive biology lesson with you but you've got an egg, you've got a sperm, sperm meets egg, egg splits in two and then you've got identical twins. So monozygotic, mono means one, so monozygotic would be identical twins. Now dizygotic twins are when the woman, for whatever reason that month, has released two eggs, both eggs have been fertilised, so the babies develop at the same time, born at the same time, but they are non-identical twins. So it would be like your brother and you being born at the same time. Uh, so Lange looked at uh, twins where one twin had been in prison uh, and he found that 10 out of the 13 monozygotic twins, they're the identical mm. twins, um, were, bo were, were both in prison. So 10 out of 13 of them, both twins were in prison, whereas the dizygotic twins, only 2 out of 17 of those were both in prison. So of all of the twins, at least one of them was in prison. Um, but with the monozygotic twins, if one of them was in prison, then the other was also in prison. So Lange concluded that um, genetics do have a role to play because monozygotic twins share 99% of their genetic material, whereas dizygotic twins share 50% of their genetic material. And so he concluded that the... Um, with the, with the monozygotic twins that there was some kind of biological reason that they were committing crime. Christiansen in 1977 found a concordance rate of 33% for the identical twins and 12% for the dizygotic twins. This means that the identical twins were more likely to have both been in prison, 21% um, more likely to have both been in prison. Uh, whereas the dizygotic twins, only 12% of them were both in prison. So he suggests that this supports the view that there might be something genetic going on, something biological. If they're sharing the genetic material and then they're both going into prison, does that suggest that there is some kind of genetic uh, link between the two? Another study done by Tilhonen et al. in 2014 revealed abnormalities on two genes that may be associated with violent crime. The MAOA gene and the CDH13 gene. The MAOA gene um, has been linked to depression um, and, uh, sorry, dopamine and serotonin levels, which has also been linked to aggressive behaviour. Um, and the CDH13 gene has been linked to substance abuse and ADHD. 
those poor people with a combination of those two genes were 13 times more likely to have a history of violent behaviour. It's quite significant. Um, the other part of biological explanations is obviously even if you have two twins and they're both in prison, um, like Christian said, Christiansen said, 33%. That's not 100%. So that suggests that there is something going on that's not biological and therefore it must be something environmental. So the diathesis stress model suggests that even if genes do have an influence on behaviour, it will also be impacted by the environment, um, such as having a criminal role model um, in the family, being part of the mafia, maybe. Um, in that case, you might be more likely to become a criminal. Going back to neural explanations, this looks at people with antisocial personality disorder, uh, more commonly known as psychopathy, but they, they changed the name recently. Um, this is associated with reduced emotional response, a lack of empathy for others, and characterises many criminals. Now, I will say that having psychopathy does not mean that you are going to become a criminal. It just means that there is a higher likelihood due to the personality characteristics that somebody with a PD or a psychopathy might share. Um, another psychologist called Rain has conducted many studies into brain differences in criminals and non-criminals. Um, he uses brain imaging techniques such as MRI to look at the brain structure of the criminal and the non-criminal um, and see what the differences are. He found that there's a reduced uh, activity in the prefrontal cortex. Um, those of you who've looked at Phineas Gage, who had the rod through his head um, and damaged his prefrontal cortex, will know that the prefrontal cortex determines your personality. It also helps regulate emotional behaviour and decision making. So Rain, in 2000, found an 11% reduction in the volume of grey matter in the prefrontal cortex compared to the control group. This suggests that criminals, when they're making decisions and accessing their prefrontal cortex, perhaps they can't, perhaps they, they're just not thinking, but there's something when they're making decisions, I'm going to do this, their prefrontal cortex isn't stopping them like it would in us. You know, if we thought, oh, I'm going to go rob this shop, you think, oh God, no, I can't do that because the police are going to catch me. You know, my parents will be really upset. I'm going to go to prison. And... You just go, okay, no, I'm not going to do it. A criminal might not have that sort of thought process going on. Uh, and then Christian and Gieses et al. in 2011 found that those with APD, or antisocial personality disorder, can experience empathy, but not in the same way as us. Now, I think this study is really, really interesting. Um, so what they did was they um, asked people with psychopathy to watch a film of somebody in pain now, they only experienced empathy when asked to do so. The rest of the time, they couldn't empathise with the person in pain on the video. But when they were asked to try and um, understand how that person was feeling, then they could empathise. The, there was this kind of idea that people with psychopathy or APD um, couldn't empathise with other people. Now, this study suggests that they can, they can just switch it off. Um, so what they did was they looked at their mirror neurons um, and these fire in response to our behaviour but also in response to somebody else's behaviour. So it helps us to be a social person. Um, and they found that only when they were asked to empathise did these mirror neurons fire, um, which Christian, Christian uh, Gieses et al. suggested that they had a switch where they could um, turn the empathy off which is, I find, really fascinating. Um, there was another study done, um, which isn't in this book, but it's a study that I've studied before, um, by a guy called Hancock. Um, and he interviewed people with psychopathy in prisons. And he showed people, psychopaths, pictures of people very, with varying emotions. Um, he showed them a picture of somebody who was scared. And they turned around and said, Oh, that's the face that somebody makes when I'm about to attack them. And it was just that total disconnect of, um, of how we would react. I would say that person is scared. You know, that was all the only way they could relate to it was by their own personal experience, which I find really fascinating and really interesting. 
So that's the genetic and neural explanation of crime. Um, next up, we will look at psychological explanations of crime, specifically starting with cognitive. Thank you for watching the video. And if you've got any questions, please feel free to ask in class or leave a comment. Thank you.